Welcome Hello. to chapter and verse. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Rick Blyweiss, and I'm uh, author of Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives, and I also am an executive Blackstone Publishing. And I'm here today with a fascinating person, uh, Jennifer Dornbush, who has been, is a screenwriter, an author, a speaker, and a forensic specialist, among a number of other things. And I hope I got that right. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy today's fascinating conversation. So uh, hi, Jen. Hi, I'm so eager. I just do dove right in to, to welcome everybody. <laughs> Works. So, so for those people who don't know you, uh, why don't you just tell, tell everybody about you, your life, how you got into writing, et cetera, and everything else you're doing. And then we'll get into some specific questions. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I'm just a small town girl. <laughs> I grew up in a little town in northern Michigan and um, a small town girl with a big childhood adventure, I guess. I grew up in Michigan uh, and it was a very interesting childhood. And I'll, we can talk a little bit about that when kind of ties into my love of forensics. But yeah. then, um, yeah, I just I, I was a small town girl with a big city heart. So after high school, I went to Chicago to okay. study, go to school, ad have adventures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I kind of ran from my calling to be a writer. So I spent a, most of my 20s working in journalism and public relations. And then I went and taught high school and college and tra traveled to, yeah. I think you're blocking the microphone when you put your hand oh, up. Oh dear, yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh no, dear, no, it's a very okay. tricky situation here. Yeah, okay. that's better. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, from- you were in Chicago, right? I was in Chicago, I love Chicago. Maybe not this time of year, but um, <laughs> yeah, I kind of, right. yeah, I kind of left my heart in Chicago, but we went on to Vermont and then eventually Phoenix and then eventually LA because I realized my heart was really in writing. My, my first love was writing um, screenplays. So I, I learned how to do that and then went to the place where you, you know, test yourself and make friends and, and see how it goes, get into it. So, <laughs> uh, so that's what kind of what I've been up to. And then along the way, uh, I, I noticed that a good number of projects that were being made into films and television shows were originally IPs, books. And uh, as any frustrated artist would do, <laughs> I kind of took a look at what was going around and said, well, I'm going to try this because maybe this is another way to take this, you know, huge stack of scripts and stories that were literally just sitting in a drawer um, and do something with them to get them out into the world. So that, oh gosh, probably seven, eight years ago is when I started writing novels and so have you, loved it were you converting your film scripts into novels or were the first novels uh totally separate from any scripts you had written yeah i the first the first part i i took a script and said i'm going to transform this into a novel i'm going to do that and since you you know you know you spend so much time working on the characters in the world i'm like i don't want to start from scratch I'm gonna start. <laughs> <laughs> i get it <laughs> that's a lot of work <laughs> Totally is. <laughs> so, so go back to you said you had a story from your childhood. Go back to that. Yeah, yeah. So, I have a background in forensic science, and I write mostly crime and mystery. And you know, just to kind of before I go all the way back, when you start into the creative world and whatever art you're in, whatever you you say to yourself, well, who am I? as an artist, like, what do I have to say to the world? <laughs> what am I, what do I talk about? What do I write about? What do I sing about? What, what do I paint about? Who am I? And as I started to explore that and what sort of ideas were percolating, I realized I kind of had this dark past <laughs> and these, I was like kind of attracted to these sort of crimey things. Okay. And, I, and I literally did not, I literally thought, oh, gosh, I wonder where that's coming from. I literally did not put the connection together that I had grown up in this world. So now to go back to my you know, babyhood, um, 
my father was um, a physician, but then a couple years into his practice, he also added on the role of medical examiner oh. in, in our county. Yeah, because they there at the time it was a job that was shuffled between all the local doctors. So if an autopsy was needed, they you know kind of like pick a straw, straw. It's your turn. <laughs> you, know, you get to good luck. You get to do it. Uh, but he found he really enjoyed it. And so he took over the office of medical examiner. And because there was really no physical office, it all came home. So for 23, 25 years, he ran the office of medical examiner for three counties. Wow. And it was all in our home. So I literally grew up with death investigation and forensics and, and things that probably children shouldn't see and be exposed to. Uh, so did you hang out so, in the rooms where he was working with cadavers and things like that? Um, you know, fortunately, that was done at the hospital. They oh. did have a morgue. Uh, so that that did not come home, but every everything else came home. The autopsy reports, the photographs, the videos. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the, the people who needed uh, the police, the, the morticians, the family members all came to our house. I mean, if they needed something, that's where it was. <laughs> that's where it was. Um, you know, you, there was no place to store tissue samples or blood samples in the county. So that was all in our house. So, wow. yeah, he transported the bodies. So just actually to save the county money because he could just do it. And also for chain of custody, he preferred right. to keep them so you know we had a suburban and that was our family suburban and there were body bags under the seat and that's where the bodies you know went back and forth <laughs> so, so were many of these uh, criminal murders as opposed to natural deaths or uh, you know what was, was it a mix I would assume so. It was. And now, of course, in my books, there's it's a much more criminal county than what, <laughs> <laughs> than what than what it actually was. But no, I mean, it was not a particularly murderous county. <laughs> there were some pretty nasty cases, but um, no, I mean, I wouldn't say I mean, no, I, not particularly murderous. But when but there were a lot of heinous deaths, you know, oh, just. Yeah. You know, just things, I don't know, farm accidents and suicides and wow. just not good things, but. You know, one of, one of my favorite TV shows is Death in Paradise. I don't know if you watch that. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah it, it takes place on this fictitious island and it's amazing how many murders they have for this small <laughs> little fictitious <laughs> island. These people are naughty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sort of yeah. reminds me of what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like Murder She Wrote, right? It's like this small town, you know, yes. coastal town, and everybody's killing each other. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> no, absolutely. So, so how did you? When is maybe the better word? When did you take that childhood experience and translate it mm -hmm. to the written page, whether that was for screen or for novel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. My, the first, so I started learning, like actually taking classes and learning the craft of storytelling, even yeah. though I was a literature major, you know, it was so different. And I had written journalistic pieces, which is storytelling, but it's very different than, as you know, than actually constructing a fictional story. I came, I feel like I came to it kind of late. I didn't really start studying that until I was 30, where mm -hmm. I actually went to class and really said, um, I went to this program called Act One in Hollywood, and, and I did it because I had heard good things about it and <clears throat> had been encouraged to go. It was very intense, four-week course every day, and I wanted to see, did I really like test myself? Like, did I really like this? And it was an absolutely transformative month. I was just like, I am, all, I, this, is, this is what I have to do. Like, wow. Full speed ahead, sacrifice, yeah. So, and then... From there, the first script that I wrote, because you know, part of the <clears throat> part of going through the course was you get paired with a mentor and you write your first script. Okay. And that first script um, was the coroner's daughter. And oh, it, yeah, and it was real, but it was really other, you know, you pitch, right? You have to pitch all these ideas. And so I'm pitching all these ideas. 
and my mentor said that one that's kind of interesting tell me more about that and so I started to tell her I really didn't know what the story was going to be I just had a seed and she said that's your story Mm -hmm. um and so really it it's all the way along it's kind of taken other people to sort of say you know that's kind of interesting like there's something there um because I think you know when you grow up in it it's just it's not interest is interesting to you because it's just what happened you know (laughs) I don't know how to explain it so so how long did it take and what was the process from the mentor going that's the one to when you had a finished script and then what happened from there it's still happening that was like 22 years ago no it's still (laughs) happening um that I mean I wrote a really terrible script and then I wrote another (laughs) draft of a really terrible script and then it it just it took a long time and then finally I was like I think this should be more of a tv show it it took a very long time and then I mean and then I find I kind of just gave up I mean I had a very good feedback but it just wasn't there and um, I kept trying to transform it to see where my, as the market changed, as my skills changed. And then um, that's the script. I said, you know, I'm going to make this into a novel. I'm kind of tired of shopping it. I'm tired of working it. I'm going to turn this into a novel. And that's where we're at today. <laughs> and as we speak, I am working with, so I have the novels, right? And now more are coming, thanks to you, which I'm very excited about. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm literally like today had a brainstorming meeting I'm, with my co-writer. We're working on the script versions for Lifetime, and we're literally like in the middle of all that right now. So wow, that's great. It's a long time. It's taken a long time. So what you write the books um, alone, but you're writing the script with a co-writer. Is that how it's working? Well, that's how this particular iteration is working yes okay yeah it's it's I don't always write with people um it is kind of fun actually to to write with people and and to see where the story goes but this particular case the producers had brought her on to be a showrunner right since I don't have showrunning experience you know they need I needed that partner okay so I'm going to stop you for a second yeah sorry go ahead no explain to people who don't know what a showrunner does what a showrunner does yes a showrunner is like the master project planner (laughs) of a tv (laughs) show (laughs) like in film the director's sort of the head chief or whatever um in tv it's the showrunner the showrunner runs the room of writers they're, they see the project through from the very beginning to when it gets on the air. Got it. Um, right. Yep, yep, yep. So. so now how different, how different is the process of writing with someone and how do you decide who's going to write what? How does that work? Yeah, um, communication. <laughs> Wait, Jess. Uh, I've written a lot of projects with people. So I, I, I love it. We, the brainstorming process we usually do together where you're kind of feeding out the story. Um, Typically what I've done with almost everybody I've written with, including this is we, one person does the first draft and then we hand it over Ah. and we keep flip-flopping it back and giving each other, like writing over each other or or giving each other notes. Um, So with this particular piece, we had to write two scripts, the first and the second. Uh, episodes and so we each wrote one and then we started flipping them back and forth so got it it's interesting (laughs) I also um did an interview with Andrews and Wilson who write military fiction and I asked them the same question they do it differently they like one of them writes a chapter and then another one will write the next chapter and you know and and they play off each other's characters and, and then they sometimes work on each other's uh, to improve, yeah. you know, I guess whatever works. <laughs> I can see how that would work really well with fiction. Yeah. yeah. I think that would, that's, it's almost like that game where you say a sentence and then someone else adds the next sentence and keep going. So how did you get your first book deal? Uh, through my amazing agent, Julie, Julie okay. Quinn. She totally took a chance on me. I mean, so how yeah. did you get to her? Let's start with that. Yeah. Did, I mean, a lot of, uh, hopefully, a lot of aspiring authors will be watching us 
and they're always wondering how do you get an agent do, so, i know how did you do it i, I know and that's always the question uh, that i was asking too i what i say go to writers conferences i was just talking with a, a new writer the other day and with the same question and i said i think the best thing to do is go to writers conferences good ones <laughs> reputable ones bigger ones and just really start talking to agents and that's what happened i was actually presenting at a writers conference and my host um i was doing like a forensic boot camp okay. and the, ho the host of my room who was there to, to help me she said at the end of the day do you have an agent I said, no, but I would like one. <laughs> <laughs> so then she introduced me to Julie. Oh, wow. And I hadn't written a single page of a novel at that oh, point. Really? I was just clear, just strictly a screenwriter. And she, we talked, we had a series of conversations and talked and I sent her some scripts, even though she was probably like, I don't know what to do with this. What is this? Um, and we agreed that we would work together for a year. I would write the novel and she would it was kind of our like probation time <laughs> probation period <laughs> so uh, so i did i i spent a, a year just writing it and getting notes from her and in the meantime trying to read and, and study more about novel writing and then two and a half years later we got the contract so it, it still took a bit um there were some reworkings that had to be done so okay and do you do you feel it is beneficial to you that you can adapt your own books into screenplays as opposed to having someone else do it because i've heard yeah. from some authors i'm not a script writer i'm a, i'm a novelist and i've heard yeah. from authors, i don't want anybody touching my work <laughs> i want to have the control over it and since you do both what are your feelings about that I think I might fall more on the side of control freak. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I love writing both. I really do. So, and I love being in the process of film and TV. Like I love that process. So I guess for me to feel, to be cut out of it is like, but no, I'm good at it. I can do it. I want to be a part of it. You know, even, even though it has its own set of challenges, it's right. I would say if you're if you consider yourself or if you can be a collaborative writer right. then and you want to write screenplays because it is a whole different art and craft yeah. it takes years to get to be competitive if you can do it do it because it's fun but if you are the kind of person who is more like no i just don't i really just don't want a lot of feedback i'm fine with just my agent or my editor that's enough um I'm, or my small critique group and i, I really don't then I probably wouldn't because it, it, it's, it can be a very frustrating process with a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Well, so I, I've had some authors um, ask me, if I want to write for film, do I need a separate agent from my literary agent or does a literary agent also get film work as, you know, as a film writer? Um, and I, I'm wondering if you have any experience or advice on that. Um, uh, only from my own experience. I know like Julie and her company, they are doing both. So any project that I write as a um, literary project, they, right. are, they have connections. They are now trying to sell into media. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Right. Um, and so what, what, if you, what if you, though, were writing a script that was not based on a book. Would would that be what? Would they do that as well, or would you need um, a, a Hollywood agent? If they you... they won't as much. They 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 won't as much. What I usually do is I give them because I do have that situation. So I will give them, um, you know, like the the log line basically, right. or like a little synopsis, and right. then they can have it in their library to pitch. Um, but in that situation, like it, they're going to do, they're not going to do, I'm going to do more of it than they are. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to engage my contacts in the film and TV world. And that's going to push it along further. Not, not that there's, you know, that's just, 
they're trying to sell literary works. Right, you know, right. That's their job. So that's yeah. good. <laughs> so, no, I, and I, I know, yeah. you know, obviously, I know Julie and Nicole very well, and I know they're great at, you know, yeah. placing books, you know, for films and things. I just, um, I also know Hollywood agents who yeah. the only thing they do is represent screenwriters. So right. yes. you know, I, I know yeah. there's two, could be two different animals, if you yeah. will, or it could be the same. Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, I don't have one right now. I'm hoping to, I've had a couple managers. Um, when COVID hit, I was like done, I was done with the manager. So, and then COVID hit and I'm just like, ah, I'll touch base when I'm ready. <laughs> like, we'll touch base in a couple of years. <laughs> but I-, I a manager in addition to I, had, I did not have a film and TV agent. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think I would like one or the other because I do believe they can open doors and that's the world they're constantly keeping in touch with, right? They're, they're talking to people all the time in that world, more right. so than a literary agent. Yeah. Um, so I do think it's beneficial, but I, but you, but what the difference between publishing and the film and TV world is um, in the film and TV world, you really have to be your own advocate. Like you really have to be out there networking. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a writer, whereas I think it's important, it's definitely important as an author, but you can't open those doors on your own. Your, your agent has to do that for the right. most part. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It, it's interesting because, you know, when, when I think of uh, what you're doing with the coroner's daughter and the coroner, et cetera, um, <clears throat> it, it would seem to me that similar to what my aspirations are for Scorpion mm -hmm. is to create a brand that transcends mm -hmm. just books yes. or books and, and film. And I've wondered, you know, it, it, I come out of the music industry where rock and roll bands had managers, you know, mm -hmm. they had booking agents, they had managers and the managers would guide more than just their musical pursuits, they would guide their brand, if you will. And mm -hmm. I, I still haven't kind of figured out as good, and I love Julie and Nicole, but I, I haven't figured out whether a literary agent becomes an, a, a manager for a writer or not. Right, yeah. In this, exactly, I, I, I understand that completely. Yeah, I, I, I just really do. Know. I think no too, yeah. 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 So um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you went from your dad doing the coroner work, if you will, um, and you were around it. So were you away from it for a while and then returned to it in writing? Or was this just there continuously in your <laughs> life in one way or the other? <laughs> I think it's still continually there <laughs> in all the stories. Um, I mean, it was in my, the, my entire childhood, I think I was probably in my mid or late twenties when he actually retired from that position. So it was sort of all, I mean, for most of my life, it was always there yeah. in some form. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting because as I've really gone deeper into this and start asking him questions, I hear a lot of stories that I didn't, they were happening, but I didn't, I was a kid. I didn't understand right. you know right what was yeah the details <laughs> so, so if somebody wanted to become a script writer film writer do you have any advice for them any tips any anything you would suggest um get trained okay get trained um well um there's tons of great books out there it can be a little confusing, um, but read them all. Honestly, I, I think I've read m almost all the big books on, on screenwriting. Just become, you know, like you would do for an author, become very acquainted with the craft and then just write, and <laughs> just write. <laughs> yeah, you, you've written a book, uh, How to Write Realistic Crime Dramas. I think it's forensic speak. So it, it, is that kind of a how-to book, if you will, for uh, uh, writers who would like to write crime for TV or film? Um, no, not as much as it is a resource guide. 
in terms of how to actually make your writing authentic. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. But the, the actual how to, I actually do that more in seminars. I'm doing one coming up with Rain Dance out of London. Okay. And um, it's, a, it's a, I think it's on March 5th, a Saturday. It's like a four hour intensive on how to actually write the craft of a crime series or thriller movie or, you know, what is the actual, you know, meat, the in recipe for that. So, and I'm, I'm, me I'm meaning to write a book on this. I've started just keeps getting pushed off. <laughs> can, can, the, can that be distilled into a sentence or two? I mean, oh, I realize it's probably a, a, a huge seminar, but I mean, it, it, it's sort of like with mystery, it's sort of like come up with the plot, put in some red herrings, you know, don't make it too obvious, but don't make it so that somebody couldn't possibly figure it out. You know, I mean. Right. I mean, Yes, you know, I, I basically, or I love to cook and bake, right? So I've organized it in terms of here's the nine ingredients that you need for a great binge worthy crime, whatever, show, show, book, whatever. And then we go through those ingredients. Cause like when you make bread, there's like four ingredients. You can mix it anywhere or not. And right. you can make a biscuit or a croissant or whatever. Same with this. It's like I give you the ingredients um, and then you get to figure out how much you want of this one and that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. So have you, you've never self-published, right? Not yet. So, okay. So let's talk yeah. about that. What, what are your it, feelings about self-publishing and why are you saying not yet? Because <laughs> um, I've been learning a lot about it and I, I, it's, I'm, I see the benefits of it. Um, I, I'm just not, I, I really love traditional publishers. I just really do. Um, I, yeah, I think that I personally need that structure. Okay. I need, yeah. uh, and that, and those cheerleaders and and a great editor is worth so much. I, I've been blessed with such great editors. So I need all that. Like, I, I think it's important and valuable. I've done both. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I personally prefer, as you're saying, the collaborative mm -hmm. group village effort of getting yeah. a book out. And um, rather than just, it's all on me and it's all on, how good I am yeah. at each one of these things, not just writing the book. Right. And, right. and that's just me. I mean, there are, I know very successful self-published authors who don't want anybody doing anything to their works but them. Mm -hmm. I think iron sharpens iron. My works have always become better because of the group effort. Um, and, and, and I, think too like I'm not a natural business person so when it comes I'm learned I've learned a lot and made huge strides but it's so not my focus and so I think having that a marketing team a publicity team like who are there to pave the path and make the plan you know I'll follow a plan all day long <laughs> all day long just don't make me make I don't want to make a business plan <laughs> so, but I'll follow it <laughs> So what do you personally do to market your books that supplements what your publisher does? Uh, of course, uh, you know, the website, the, I have a newsletter I send out every month. I do minimal social media uh, speaking. I like to speak. I like to teach. And that's always a great opportunity to invite people into your world and your work. Um, I'll do events all day long. I like events, you know, yeah. I like going to conferences and book signings and I'm not, I'm an introvert, but I'm a social introvert. So, <laughs> so. That's a good, good phrase, social yeah, I, introvert. I like that. <laughs> I love you for like four hours and then I need my alone time. <laughs> have you ever used a pen name? No, I never have. Mm -mm. Okay, yeah, I, I, it's interesting because uh, there, I think I've seen benefits to using them and not using them, but yeah. I, I don't know, it, it's interesting. I've never felt the need, that's never say never, but you know. Yeah, so. And, and what do you enjoy more, writing books or writing films? 
ways. My goodness, people, I don't know. I really like both. Like today, I got I'm I'm kind of working simultaneously on a book and a and a couple scripts, and it's really nice to to ta- toggle between the two because they're very different brain. It works different parts of the brain. Um, you know, with the books, I'm always like, I've got to get to 2,000 words today, and I'm like watching the count, the word count. You know, with scripts, it's like how few words can I use? <laughs> so, so do you do you actually do set goals for yourself on daily word counts on books? Um, well, especially when I'm on deadline. Yeah, I, I, I tend to do it more by the week i'll set a yes. weekly goal rather yeah. than say i got to do a thousand words a day yeah say, i want to do x in the week and then it's yeah. up to me to catch up at the end of the week when exactly I'm yeah or be like yes i'm over yay I can <laughs> exactly. take a walk. yeah yeah i would say i've kind of broken it down to okay by the end of february i need this many words uh-oh mm. where am i at yeah. <laughs> and, and what what is your process do you uh, outline books in, in, in scripts in the beginning or do you know or do they just you sit there and they come to you and you capture them or how do you do yeah. this? what's your process um screenwriters are taught to be plotters I mean it is essential and when like if you're sitting if you're working with someone as, or if you're even sitting in a writer's room you plot things down to the minutest detail so I I'm very comfortable with that okay. I find a lot of comfort in that because I've been doing it for 20 plus years however I'm starting so I do that with my scripts very much so however I'm learning about so I started doing that with my novels and now I'm realizing oh I think I'm a pantser. Oh, this is new. So I'm like, oh, because like today I sat down, I have like a little, like a line or a sentence or two. This is what this chapter is about. And I'm like, oh, and I'm finding I love it. I love to see where it goes. And I'm finding I come, I come to my computer and my chair and I'm like, what's going to happen today? <laughs> but I know where the story's going. But wow, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I tend to write that way. I mean, I, I don't write screenplays. I'm just mm-hmm. writing books, novels. But I, um, I basically just sit down and let whatever plays out in my brain play out and then capture it. And yeah. I'll go back later and say, okay, mm-hmm. I need to add this scene or modify this or that. Yeah. But I don't have any idea where my books are going. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm so glad to be in that company with you because I was never, I was more of like, I got to figure it all out. And now I'm just, I'm having a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. It just popped up. I've got to get rid of on my screen. Uh-oh. Okay. Hopefully okay. it will come back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, 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 it's interesting. Um, so what, uh, what advice would you give, uh, authors, either of books or screenplays or both, as to, you know, just, hey, here's Jennifer's (laughs) advice. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I'm definitely not that overnight success. Um, And the only thing that's kept me going, I should, really the only thing is just not giving up. Okay. And there's a whole suitcase to be unpacked behind that and what it takes not to give up because <laughs> people throw that term out there, right? Yeah. But there's really, <clears throat> there's baggage behind it, um, which is probably, you know, a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but, well, well I've, I've had yeah. manuscripts I've written rejected, you know, and, and short yeah. stories I've written rejected. And, you know, I, I, some of the advice that I give to authors is, you know, aside from what you said, keep writing. I mean, writers yeah. should write and eventually you'll hit something. But yeah. the other thing is you just can't let negative negativity and rejection stop you. You got to mm-hmm. believe in yourself and just plow through it. And eventually, if you're good, you'll hit. Exactly. It's so true. And that's part of that baggage. Like part of the stuff you have to work through when you're trying not to give up is, is exactly that. Like believing in yourself and faith and and not the negative can be so powerful, but the positive is more powerful. So I agree. There's, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, you know, the, the industry, uh, 
entertainment, not just book writing or film writing. Mm -hmm. Entertainment is littered with projects and that became hugely successful and artists became hugely successful that were rejected by record company, publisher, film company, whatever. And they just eventually believe in themselves and won out. And yeah. there are books that have come out that got panned and they became huge hits. And, mm -hmm. just, you know, you can't let that derail you. No. And some of my favorite musicians or, or artists or writers are those people. And thank goodness, because we have them in the world now. We so have you, that. you also had a career in journalism. What, what, what was that? That was fun. I love, um, I just love story. That's, <laughs> I just right. have always been a storyteller. So yeah, I worked in both in Michigan and Chicago and Arizona. Actually, I just did a freelance article a couple of weeks ago for a national paper. I just kind of pick it up when I find something interesting, but it just really stems from my love of story. And just, yeah, I've, to I've told all kinds of stories. <laughs> so. And do you get those placed by your agents or do you get to place those yourself or how, how does that work? Yeah, that's just me pounding the pavement. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Just, I don't know any journalistic agents, but yeah, I'm not afraid to just, you know, reach out to someone and say, hey, I have an idea. <laughs> Got it. So what are you working on now? I'm working on the next three books of the Coroner's Daughter series, specifically right. the third book. I'm very, very excited about. And I'm working on one, two, three scripts. Um, the ones for Lifetime, and then actually just a couple spec scripts that are TV series that I've been working on for a while. Oh, cool. Yes, that's good. It's good. And um, that's enough right now. <laughs> I've got a lot of things on my list, but. <laughs> So how many hours during the day do you actually write? Because it sounds like you got so many things you're writing. I would imagine you have to devote a fair number of hours per day. And do you write every day? And for how many hours? Yeah, um, I'm so blessed because this is my full-time job. And I, I write, I do my office hours every day, my nine to six or seven. Um, and a good portion of those are spent writing. There's other, you know, there's answering emails and marketing and doing all that other stuff too. But, you know, the majority are spent writing. <laughs> so, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's it's good. good. I love it. So, do you have any humorous anecdotes or interesting anecdotes from any of any of your pursuits that you have done that, that you might like to share? Oh, goodness. Um... Well, I, let's see. Oh my goodness. I'm sure there's millions. Um, and maybe some, I shouldn't be sharing. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you a funny forensic story, just sure. like totally gallows humor. But, okay. um, when I was 16 and, and learning to drive, I need to preface this by saying I, when I was in high school, I worked at a flower shop. Okay. Uh, probably the most lovely job I've ever had. Um, <laughs> it's quite lovely to be a florist. And um, my boss was, so my bosses, they owned the flower shop. He was a cop. He was a, um, I think it was, a, it was a local police officer, not a sheriff. Yeah. And she, you know, she worked the shop, but he kind of, you know, pitched in, but he, but they were, fr he was friends with my dad, you know, everybody, because they all knew each other. Right. And um, <clears throat> so that's that's the preface to this. So it's family friend. Okay. So when I was 16, learning to drive, one of my dad's requirements for us, I have two sisters, us daughters, was we had to go with him to investigate a scene where the person died of drunk driving. Oh. Okay. Which that's not funny. <laughs> but, no, <laughs> but, you're like, where is this going? Oh, this is very serious. Uh and, but it was a good lesson, right? Because he really wanted it to, us to never drink. Right drunk. Right yes. drunk. Mm -hmm. It worked, by the way. So, <laughs> um, um, and thank goodness now for Uber. Yeah. But, um, so I, but I was petrified. Like there was a time in my life where I thought this was really weird, gross kind of work. And I was really embarrassed by what he did. And I just, well, was, you know, I was a teenager and it's like, I just, thought people would think I was weird and you know anyway um so I had to go with him and 
I, he's like, you, you have to go with, but you don't have to get out. You can stay in the car. I'm like, okay, I'm staying in the car. I'm not. So I, so he gets out and he, they go down, the cops are there and this family friend and everybody's doing their job. And um, fortunately this guy didn't kill anybody else except for himself, but because that happens a lot where they kill other people, but not themselves. Um, and so they bring the body and put it into, so I'm sitting in the front of our suburban in the passenger seat, right? Like stiff as a board, just I'm not going to look left. I'm not going to look right. I'm just like, when is it going to be over? When is it going to be over? You know, just like not moving. And it's summer. It's hot. There's no air conditioning on in the car. And I, I'm sweating, but I'm just like, I'm not getting out. I'm not. <laughs> they slide that body in the back of the, of the suburban. And now I'm like, oh no, I'm sitting in a car with a dead body. <laughs> like, this is worse. <laughs> like, and I'm like, what have I done? But yet I'm frozen. I literally can't move. And all of a sudden I hear the body bag start to crinkle. Really? Like, yeah. Like somebody's trying to get out of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And I'm so freaked out. But I couldn't move. I literally couldn't move. And I'm just, and it's dead quiet. And I'm just like waiting. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 on the back of the truck. And I just jump. <laughs> I literally jumped and this cop had like totally played a joke on me and oh, totally right. scared me and everybody was laughing at me. <laughs> you know, it sounds to me like you could write a comedy series too. I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm going to call it home bodies. <laughs> there you go. That's great. You know, there, there have been comedies about junkyards and stuff like that. There could be one about cars yes. and dead people. That would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> truth be told, that's more of what I watch. I watch a lot of comedies. So. <laughs> I, I do too. I, I find uh, that there's enough stress in the world that yes. I need to add additional stress. I want the, the relief. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Absolutely. This has been fascinating. I, I appreciate you joining me. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't, uh, you know, or that you'd <laughs> like to talk about uh, at all before oh, we? Gosh. I don't know. I hate talking about myself. <laughs> I hate... You do a um, job of it. I don't know. Uh, what, right? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, no, just uh, if there are any writers out there who are have questions about death or death investigation, I'm available. I mean, I, I, I'm very accessible. So email is all through my website. I'm very accessible through my website. And um, my newsletter is, is a lot about it, forensics. And so I just, I, I, I welcome that because I, I love to hear from, from readers and writers and hear what, you know, if they have questions or, you know, some people, a lot of people just write too, like I, how do I do this? How do I, you know, I love to encourage people because I've, I've been there where I didn't feel the encouragement or I felt such doubt in myself. It took me, I mean, I ran from my calling for 10 plus years. Wow. Just, so is your yeah. website, jenniferdornbush.com? It is jenniferdornbush.com. Good. And yeah. one last question, what, what would you love to have happen in the future? I mean, would you love to have a huge hit TV show, a best-selling, I mean, the answer obviously is D, all of the above. But I mean, <laughs> if you had to pick one, what would you like to be known for? What would you like to have been excelled in? My, this is, I love this, but I actually, this is great. Of course I want all of it. Uh, but, um, you know, my personal mission, like my, my career mission and personal mission is really to shed hope and light into the dark recesses of the human spirit. Yes. I think we are so, like you said, bombarded. And these last two years have been quite evidence of that. If you didn't see it before, <laughs> you saw it now. <laughs> and that's really the goal of my um, life, um, personally and professionally. So that's what I hope that I'll be remembered for, a person who shed light and hope into people's worlds, whether it was through writing or, you know, a phone call or whatever. Um, but what I really would like, what I'd love to see just on a fun kind of level, yes. this is going to sound so crazy. I fly a lot. I travel a lot. <clears throat> and, you know, when you're in the airport and those um, new newsstand kiosks that mm -hmm. have the snacks and the, the books and the magazine, oh, yeah. 
And you know, the books that they have are, only, they can only carry so many books, right? Right. And it's always like the top sellers. I want to see my book in an, all the airports. I want to see your was, book in, I want to see your book in the airport too. I know it's crazy, but it's like I, if I can walk, you know, I'm walking through O'Hare or whatever JFK, and I see my, I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> but I have to just tell you a quick story. When you talk about O'Hare in Chicago, um, I went to Chicago in the middle of winter one year to a business meeting, and I'm walking on Lakeshore yeah. Drive. Oh and the wind is blowing and I'm holding on to the ropes so that I don't get blown down the street. It is the coldest I have ever been in my life. I know, I I feel it right now, I understand. <laughs> well, I, you're in sunny LA and, and, <laughs> and I'm in Southern Oregon, which isn't as bad as, yeah. as uh, Chicago <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. This has oh been gosh. delightful. I, I hope you've enjoyed it because I certainly have. <laughs> I have. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me. And I'm so happy to be a part of your little family over there. It's not little, it's growing. It's it's yeah. huge. It's expanding. So I'm I'm thrilled. Well, I'm thrilled to have you as part of it. And I'm thrilled to be part of it too, believe me. Yeah. So it, it's mutual totally. Well, great. Well, thank you again. And, uh, yeah, I, I wish you the absolute best of success with everything you're doing, and uh, I'm gonna do my part to make sure your books are as successful as possible. I know, I know you will. I have no doubt. I appreciate that. So, well, right. thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, if you've enjoyed this, go check out some of the other chapter and verse things that uh, I've I've done, and you'll learn a lot from everybody I'm speaking with. Thank you. Thank you, Rick.